Well, good morning. I hope this isn't the beginning of a slippery slope. It gets a little chilly and a little rainy and we have to retreat inside. We want to be those tough Christians, right? <laughs> well, those of you who are here this morning, by the way, as my mentor used to say, you get extra credit for coming out uh, on this secular holiday. So, let's enjoy it. This was so that we who first hoped in the King might live for the praise of His glory. In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. So here we are on the 4th of July, uh, the day the Declaration of Independence was signed. And my attention was captured just yesterday uh, by a column in the Wall Street Journal about the friendship between Thomas Jefferson and John Adams. Uh, it was written by Peggy Noonan, who was a speechwriter for one of our former presidents. Uh, Jefferson and Adams, two of the primary drafters of the Declaration of Independence, and two of the uh, individuals who had the most influence on the form of government, uh, that was ultimately described uh, and prescribed in our Constitution. Uh, they both came from different backgrounds, both had different temperaments, but they worked together brilliantly. And they became great, great friends. They, they passed back and forth uh, a huge volume of correspondence. But, uh, ultimately, their friendship was broken. They fell out over, what else? Politics, which they were so involved in. And largely it was their individual uh, respective uh, positions and opinions about the validity and the wisdom of the French Revolution. And they became estranged for more than 20 years. A great friendship ruined, and two great men divided estranged. Well, division and estrangement are very common within human relationships throughout history, aren't they? It seems sometimes to be the rule that we're divided. It seems to be the rule that we're estranged from one another as opposed to the exception to the rule. And of course, it all began at the fall, didn't it? There were Adam and Eve in perfect union with God, but then they rebelled, and their perfect union was broken, divided. They became estranged from God, and God even, God tells Eve that you're going to be estranged, you're going to actually have enmity, animosity, hatred with your husband, and your offspring are also going to be divided. There's going to be enmity between them. And of course we see it more and more continuing throughout the course of history. Today, I don't know if it's gotten worse, it certainly hasn't gotten better. We see division in human relationships everywhere. We see it in families with uh, the still very high rate of divorce in our country. We see parents estranged from children siblings estranged from their siblings. Uh, my local newspaper, the uh, New Report Daily News, is about that thick. Uh, and there are two things that I go to every morning. They still have Dear Abby and the comics. And I start there. But Dear Abby is almost every day about some broken relationship among family members. Of course, we have division today in our church, we're trying to pay some attention to this. The division among races, people of different ethnic backgrounds. And we know it's not just white versus black, it's not just white versus Asian, white versus Latin. We know that it's really everybody against everybody, even the minorities against the minorities, one ethnicity against the other. You know, the Italians didn't want to have anything to do with the Irish. On and on and on. And of course, division in our country. You know, the preamble to the Constitution begins with we the people of the United States 
in order to form a more perfect union. Well, we're more possibly divided today than we were at the time of the Civil War. We're divided by politics, by culture wars, the polarization among us, the demonization of each other, bitterness, unfriending people who hold a different position than we do. And people even now beginning to raise questions about the motives of those folks who framed the Constitution and whether we should even celebrate this day. That kind of division, that kind of brokenness. And the church doesn't escape it either, does it? I'm told there are more than 30,000 Christian denominations in the world. 30,000. That means division, 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 right? Liberal church, conservative church, high church, low church. There's division within the Anglican communion. And yes, within the churches in our province and within uh, churches in our diocese. And that often results in this kind of party spirit that was uh, a problem in Corinth, right? Paul uh, castigates the people because of their party spirit. Hey, I'm with Apollos. Hey, I'm with Paul. We haven't come very far. We still have this division. And this really is bad. This brokenness in human relationships throughout uh, throughout our culture is really a bad thing, and certainly a bad thing within our church. It's not what God created. God who created perfect harmony in the Garden of Eden. And it's certainly not his intent. It's not what he intended for us. So we might ask ourselves this morning, well, is this just the way it is, and is this just the way it's going to be forever and ever? Amen. Has God given up? I know if I were running this show, I might be tempted to give up uh, with all of the division and the estrangement among us. But Paul gives us a good answer today in our Ephesians passage. These 14 verses which we uh, heard Jennifer read a few moments ago, these 14 verses were actually one sentence in the Greek, and they are just chock full of good news. Go back and read them. Because Paul gives us a number of reasons to bless God. In fact, there's enough there for a whole theology textbook, and it might take longer than the 45 minutes I'm allowed to preach this morning. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> uh, but I want to concentrate. I've lost my power? Can you hear me anyway? Yes. Yeah. You. Okay. Okay. Uh, but uh, I want to focus just on two or, two or three things that uh, Paul points out this morning. One is, in verse 10, he tells us that God has made known to us the secret of his purpose. Just as he wanted it to be, and set it forward in him as a blueprint for when the time was ripe. His plan was to sum up the whole cosmos in the King, Jesus Yes, everything in heaven and on earth in him. Or the English uh, Standard Version uh, translation, a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. We are not stuck forever with this broken world that's marked by division and estrangement. God's plan is to restore unity. God's plan is to restore the harmony that existed in Eden. He's going to do that one day. Here in this chapter even, Paul tells the Gentiles in Ephesus that God in Christ has broken down the wall of hostility between the Jews and the Gentiles. And that's what God has done for all of us, broken down the wall of hostility between us and Him. And His intention one day is to break down all walls of hostility and bring all into unity and harmony. Jesus came to redeem 
and restore all that was broken as a result of the fall. I call this God's great restoration project. All will be in harmony. Remember the prophecy from Isaiah? Isaiah 11, he says, The wolf will dwell with the lamb, and the leopard shall lie down with the young goat, and the calf and the lion and the fatted calf together. And the little child shall lead them. The cow and the bear shall graze. Their young shall lie down together. And the lion shall eat straw like the ox. The nursing child shall play over the hole of the cobra, and the weaned child shall put his hand on the adder's den. They shall not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain. Now, Woody Allen, I'm reading this, uh, is alleged to have said, I've always liked the lion will lie down with the lamb, but the lamb won't get much sleep. <laughs> Another humorist said that the lion and the lamb may sometimes possibly lie down together, but if you'll notice carefully, when the lion gets up, the lamb is generally missing. But don't these jokes just highlight the incredibly sheer implausibility of Isaiah's vision from our standpoint? As we look at our experience today, how unlikely is this idea of complete unity one day. It's so rem far removed from our experience that we can't imagine it. But imagine it. Revelation promises that God is going to bring a new heaven and a new earth. His plan is that everything will work together perfectly the way he originally designed it. Divisions will be healed, personal, Political, religious divisions will be healed and people will live in peace. Perfect harmony with one another. No war. No physical war. No culture wars. What? How great is that? Well, that's one day. But here we are today, right? Well, in this passage, Paul also reminds us that we who first hoped in the king have been redeemed through his blood, the wealth of his grace which he has lavished on us, our sins have been forgiven. And that is good news, isn't it? But it isn't the whole good news. Paul tells us also that we are saved to live for God's glory. I wonder if sometimes our understanding of salvation isn't all too limited. We, do we limit it sometimes to just the idea that our sins have been forgiven? But do we not emphasize and not focus on the fact that we need to live for God's glory? Dallas Willard, in his book, The Spirit of the Discipline, says, somehow we've gotten the idea that the essence of faith is entirely a mental an inward thing. I don't think anyone wanted or planned that state of affairs. We've simply let our thinking fall into the grip of a false opposition of grace to works that was caused by a mistaken association of works with merit. And history has only made matters worse. It has built a wall between faith and grace and what we actually do. He goes on to say, the message of Jesus himself and of the early disciples was not just one of the forgiveness of sins, but rather was one of newness of life. Which, of course, involved the forgiveness as well as his death for our sins. And yet, that newness of life also involved more beside. To be saved was to be delivered from the power of darkness and translated into the kingdom of his dear son. We who are saved are to have a different order of life from that of the unsaved. We live in a different world. What a great description of salvation, isn't it? We're not just saved from the penalty of sin. 
so that we can go to heaven one day. But we're also saved for something. I remember one guy once said, I thought religion was something you suffered from, not for. <laughs> yes, we need to know we're forgiven. We need to know that we have hope in Christ. But we also need to hear what an old radio announcer used to call the rest of the story. The rest of the story that we are saved for something. Hey, thank you, Ian. Today I, I had to uh, do what Ian usually takes care of my microphone until so he hasn't stopped. <laughs> Living for the glory of God, we take part in this great restoration project in Jesus. We continue his ministry in our world today. We participate in what N.T. Wright would call building for the kingdom. He says, God alone will sum up all things in Christ, things in heaven and on earth. He alone will make the new heaven and new earth. It would be the height of folly to think that we could assist in that great work. But what we can and must do in the present, if we are obedient to the gospel, if we are following Jesus, and if we are indwelt, energized, and directing directed by the Spirit, is to build for the kingdom of God. We can and must be building for that kingdom, in which unity and harmony prevail in all human relationships. Well, Jefferson and Adam's friendship was restored, in large part thanks to the work of a kingdom builder, even though he may not have known it, Benjamin Rush, who was a fellow signer of the Declaration of Independence. Uh, Rush was a friend of both Jefferson and Adams. Uh, he often had dreams, I think they may have been prophetic dreams, and he would share them with people. And uh, as Jefferson's second term as president was coming to an end in 1809, Adams uh, sent a mischievous little letter to uh, to Benjamin Rush and he said, hey, have you had any uh, dreams about Jefferson lately? <laughs> well, a couple of months later, Benjamin Rush responded to Adams and said, yes, I have. I had a dream that your friendship with President Jefferson was restored. Adams replied, I think that may be prophecy. A couple of years later, in 1812, Adams sends the letter to Jefferson. Uh, in the interim, Rush had also sent something to Jefferson. Uh, and he had suggested to Jefferson, he said, Hey, you know, you used to love Adams. Don't you think maybe you all should get back together again? And he had suggested to Adams, Hey, maybe it's time to let bygones be bygones. So Adam sends the letter to Jefferson, and Jefferson receives it, and he starts writing back. Their friendship is restored, and for the rest of their lives, they continue the great correspondence, their great affection for one another that they had had before. New Year's Day, well, no. So uh, a few years later, 1826, on the 50th anniversary of the Declaration of Independence signing, July 4, 1826, both Adams and Jefferson died. Adams' last breath was, Jefferson still survives. At the end of her article, Penny, Peggy Newman says, as the fourth explodes around us, we should take some inspiration from the story of an old estrangement healed. We're all trying to repair something. May you have a Benjamin Rush. Do we see ourselves as kingdom builders? Are we all trying to repair something? Could each of us be a Benjamin Rush? What would that even look like? Well, maybe it looks something like this. I'm going to live my life mindful of the reality that I'm a child of God's kingdom and act affirmatively to bring that kingdom about in every 
your sphere of my life? What did it look like I'm going to continue the ministry of Jesus in my life? Mindful of the division in the world around me and doing what I can to heal those divisions. Jesus was the great mediator, wasn't he? A great mediator and peacemaker. Healing the division between us and our Father. Making peace between us and our Father. To continue the work of Jesus is to continue that work of mediating and peacemaking. So, it's not easy, is it? We see Jesus in our gospel this morning. And he's, as all his neighbors are saying, who does he think he is, is what they're really saying. He's just the carpenter's kid down the street. Brothers of those guys. It's not easy. He was rejected, and that wasn't the only time. He was rejected right to the end. He was rejected by, as John says, his own did not receive him. But we will be called to that same rejection. I moved into my condo association about five years ago. And uh, I was there for three months, and then all of a sudden there was this incredible uh, deluge of hateful emails going back and forth among all the people. There was a breach uh, of the harmony in the village. And one night, a couple of people came to my house with a petition to recall the board. And I naively signed that petition because I thought, you know what? We'll all get down and we'll sit down and we'll talk, and then we'll work out our differences, and then we'll vote, and I'll probably vote for the same people that are on the board, but at least we can stop this incredible hostility. Well, all these people decided they hated me because I signed the petition. So I went back to several of them and explained why I did it, and it helped. But that division still lives. We are rejected. Our efforts will fail. But Jesus calls us to pick up our cross daily and to follow him. As we've been talking about trying to become a more cultured church, as we've been talking about trying to uh, start with better relationships with people different from us, we've looked at it sometimes as this big project. But the answer has been just do something. It's big, just do something. May we become a Benjamin Rush. May we continue the ministry of Jesus, taking up our cross daily and just doing something for the glory of God. I'd like to end uh, by asking us all to pray together the prayer uh, that has been attributed to St. Francis. And uh, Michael, you've chosen a beautiful picture of St. Francis there, especially... It kind of looks like a dog to me. And for a church that loves dogs, I thought that was a great picture. So if you find it on your bulletin, on your phone, let's say this prayer together. Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is discord, union. Where there is error, truth. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. Where there is sadness, joy. O Divine Master, grant that I may seek not so much to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to love as to love. For it is in giving that we receive, it is in pardoning that we are pardoned, and it is in dying that we are born to eternal life.